I am so excited for this. <laughs> <laughs> so Nina, hi, how are you? Thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? You know, I'm absolutely wonderful. Super happy to be here. Thank you, Cindy. We ask our guests at the beginning um, of our program every time about their journey into early care and education and child care. So would you mind taking a few moments to kind of give us that journey that, that you've experienced? Yes, absolutely happy to. So um, um, probably like everybody else, well, probably half of the early care and education field, I came into this um, in a completely non-planned way. And so I went to undergrad school for international relations and political science and was very much prepared to um, do something either with the law or rules or regulation and absolutely nothing to do with children. That was what I was going to do and um, was going to do something very much to do with other things. Ended up going to grad school for diplomacy and international economics. And my dissertation was actually on women and children refugees and the economics of women and children refugees pre and post World War II, which probably sounds very, very dry, but is very, very, um, very telling in terms of what ended up happening with Hitler, what ended up happening with how he defined what a refugee was and really how it has changed how we feel basically the whole entire Western world, how we feel about immigrants and refugees, and frankly, women and children refugees and immigrants um, post-World War II, so post-1940s, 1950s, and basically how we treat women workers and children these days. So fast forward, um, I moved to California after I was in grad school and was looking for something to do and something um, that I was interested in doing. And again, very much was interested in doing some type of policy work and ended up being headhunted by a private association um, that worked for for-profit childcare agencies, and they were looking for a policy analyst. And I was not yet ready to work. I was sitting on the beach in Half Moon Bay, and I said, if you pay me this much ridiculous amount of money, I will come and I will work for you. And I got a call back um, about an hour and a half later saying, you better be worth the money. And yes, well, hire you. So I guess I was worth the money because I ended up working there for about six years. And that really got me very, very interested in working in the early childhood education world, especially around rules and regulations, around policy, around inequities in the system, around workforce issues. And um, since that time, I have now moved on to the subsidized um, public side of the early care and education uh, world and work now for every child. California and have been there, surprise, surprise, for about 20 years. So uh, for never working, um, deciding never to work with uh, children, have now been working in that field for 25 years and could not be more happier that I actually ended up finding myself in this place. So quite a bit of a circuitous route, if you will, but very, very happy and pleased to um, be here and very happy, Cindy, that you were able to invite me um, on the show today. Well, uh, now I just want to have you on the show five more times because I think <laughs> there is, uh, no, seriously, I, and I don't say that lightly, but it never occurred to me to look that far back in history to kind of help me contextualize what I've experienced in my early care and education journey. And I, I would suspect that our audience was probably a little surprised by that. So it might be worth doing a deeper dive or maybe a blog article and helping us connect all of those dots. I, I just know that when I met you, I could tell right away that you were going to help shape policy in California and help us all kind of understand those, maybe some of the unconscious bias, some of the things that happen in our world today, and to really consider some of the unintended consequences that happen during policy and rulemaking. 
So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm even more intrigued to speak with you today. Um, but for today, I have to just say, I too love Half Moon Bay. So I'm glad you had time <laughs> sitting on that beach. It's, it's one of the ones that I grew up exploring in my early childhood. So we have so much more in common than I even knew over the last 10 or 15 years that I've known you. Mm -hmm. um, but our topic today is the cost of childcare. And yes. so Nina, to help us get started, could you take us through sort of the costs surrounding childcare and early learning and kind of what's happened in the past, what's happening now and what we might expect in the future? Yes, absolutely. So um, as we all know, all of your listeners know, you and I know um, very, very intimately child care and early learning is very, very expensive. And the reason being is that in order to have a very high quality experience for our young ones, you have to have a quality, very well educated. And I don't mean necessarily like book smart educated. I mean, a individual who is very well versed in the developmental milestones of young children and how to interact with young children, how to know what behavioral norms are, how to work with them, um, how to de-escalate de them, right? How to, um, you know, work with little kids. It's very, very challenging. And um, yeah. so in order to do that, get someone who has the appropriate skill set and to ensure that there's the appropriate adult to child ratio, it is very, very expensive because we need to ensure that the, there are enough individuals to oversee our young ones and that they have the appropriate um, education to do so. And so as a result, when you are, when we are all looking at early education programs, on average, around 80 to 85% of all of the overall budgets of child care centers, family child care homes, what have you, go towards staffing costs. And um, when you look at that, they are a very, very expensive business model because then you only have around 15%, 20%, if you're lucky, to pay for everything else. Everything else would be food, that would be rent, electricity, utilities, overhead, books, supplies, all of those wonderful um, extra things that you we all know you need to pay for. Um, on top of that, you can only charge what the market can bear. And certainly in the United States, there has never been a very, very high priority placed on early care systems. For the longest time in you know, the 40s and the 50s, there was never a subsidized system put in place, except for during World War II. During World War II, there was a federal um, program put in place as men were going off into um, to fight for our country. Women were increasingly going into um, areas of work. And what, what the federal government was seeing was that children were increasingly left alone and there were increasingly child endangered, children were getting endangered. There were increasing accidents on children, children were in factories, children were left in cars alone. And so the federal government said these women were going into factories in order to help us with the war effort. And so we need to help these women to ensure that their children are in safe environment. And so at that time, during the late 40s, there was um, an act called the Lanham Act. And um, as a result, anyone, uh, regardless of income, regardless of age of child, was given child care um, at that point if they needed it. That continued throughout the war effort. And then around 1949, 1950, so as the war obviously had ended, but, you know, men were coming back from the war, um, all of that ceased on a federal a federal level. The only states that continued that were the state of New York and the state of California. That's important because both California and New York ended up creating these subsidized child care systems, i.e. the state and the federal government decided to continue to subsidize child care for lower income families. So because of that, the cost for child care for low income families in both of these areas was always subsidized, i.e. it was paid for in part by an entity, whether it be the state government or the federal government. And so as a result of that, even the private market in California, let's say, 
has always been artificially low because a rule in California, well, a rule in the federal government is that if you receive any subsidy, so that if your program takes any subsidy, you cannot charge any more for a private pay client than you can that from the amount that you are receiving a subsidy. So let's say you are receiving $100 for a child in subsidy. Even if you could get $150 for that child in the private market, you can only charge $100 for that. So if you think back all the way to 1950, that no program has ever been able to charge actually the real market rate you know, now think until 2024, the entire market across the nation has always been artificially reduced. And the reason being is that um, some of your some of your listeners are probably saying, well, Nina, you're only talking about the subsidized market. We're we're private pay. Like what on earth are you talking about? How is that relating to all of these private child care out there? Well, the reality of the um, the makeup of all of the childcare in the nation is that there is so much subsidized childcare out there. The United States government, um, through the um, Child Care Development Block Grant, is probably the biggest purchaser of childcare in the nation. And because they have this artificially low subsidy method, right? Because they pay so low, it actually affects the entire reimbursement system in the entire nation, and especially in California. And so what we're seeing is unless you are a child care center, perhaps in a very affluent area. So if you are based in Marin, for example, if you're in Belvedere, if you're in Tiburon, if you're in Palo Alto in the Bay Area, if you're in certain pockets in LA, perhaps in Santa Monica, certain other pockets, you know, in, in San Diego, what have you, certainly there are programs, small programs, especially that are able to charge much, much higher rates. Everyone else is having to charge basically the same rate that the subsidized um, rate that the government is paying. And what we're seeing is that 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 subsidized rate has always been reduced simply because it is paying on this artificial rate that has always been too low, simply because that is only what the the rate is. And the reason why it is so low is the way that the market is, or excuse me, the rate that the, the way that that rate is determined is this, the state of California, for example, but it works across the entire nation. They do a survey every couple of years and they survey every single provider in the state who is willing to fill out the survey. And they say, how much do you charge for an infant? How much do you charge for a toddler? How much do you charge for a preschooler? How much do you charge for a school age child? Perfect. And then they take all of those rates and they um, do some wonderful calculations and then they average it out depending on county, right? We all know counties have complete variation differences, but what they try to do is they average it by county. So certain Certainly you're going to have winners and losers, right? In certain counties, you're going to have, uh, you know, higher edge counties, which are going to, you know, skew to the higher side. There's going to be lower counties that are going to skew to the lower side. And so you may think, okay, well, that's all right. We're averaging it. Then what the state says is we are only going to pay 80% of that. So then all of a sudden, you've got this average and then the state says we are only going to pay 80% of that average. And that's why I say it's so artificially low. So you've already got all of these programs, which tell you, this is how much I charge. And now the state averages it out. So it could be higher or lower, most probably a little bit lower. And then they say of that rate, we will only pay you 80% of that. And so as a result, all of our programs across the entire state are not being paid what they are telling us they need to pay, that they need to be paid in order to run their program effectively. And so where we find ourselves is this has now been in existence for 60 years. And so um, our programs, all of our child care programs, and many of your listeners are probably saying, well, you know, for my infant, I'm paying $2,000 a month. That's a lot of money to me. Absolutely. It's a lot of money, but really how much they need to be paid is probably $3,000. And it's not because they're lining their pocket with all of this extra money. It's just because of inflation, rents, um, workers comp, 
all of these other issues, all of these other costs are just compounding. And so that's really where we're finding ourselves, Cindy, and sort of some of the historical context, if you will, on why we're finding ourselves so behind. And, um, I, and I hope that that was um, a good sort of very quick history lesson, if you will, because each of those years is compounded on top of the other. And so it's not just, you know, the each each program is being paid 80% of what it needed to get. Each year is being paid 20% less of, than what it actually needed to. So it's being tw paid 20% less this year, 20% less next year, 20% less the year after that. And so that's why we're seeing programs are progressively going out of business when um, directors or owners of centers are retiring. There's no one wishing to take them over. When family childcare homes are retiring, the, the proprietors of them are retiring, no one is willing to take them over. And that's why we're seeing some of these small mom and pops are actually being bought by larger chains, such as Kinder Care, Knowledge Learning, La Petite, because they're able to take up some of these smaller mom and pops and with economies of scale in their HR, in their hiring, and some of their administrative practices, they're able to operate them. And so we're really in a very, very interesting crisis right now coming out of some of the COVID protections, if you will, um, that we're in a very unique situation and um, California is in a very unique situation as it is. And so that's why there's so much, there's been so much in the news around childcare and why we are in such a dire circumstance and why it's always in the news right now on why childcare centers and family childcare homes are closing. I think that was a really good and articulate, clear way to explain that, Nina. I have just a couple of follow-up questions that I'm curious about simply from my own experience when running my businesses in California. Um, so tell me whether or not this rule is still in place. When I was there, they also capped the number of subsidized children that any care provider could actually have. So if you you take um, into consideration a family childcare home that might be able to have um, a large license for 14 children. Out of that 14 children, they might be capped at only having X number of those children be subsidized children. But then on top of that, they cap the rate you can charge your private person. And the same was true in center care. Is that rule still in place as well? That rule is still in place for family child care, and that rule is still in place for one type of center. Um, so if okay. you are a private center and you are accepting what they call a voucher, that is absolutely mm -hmm. still the case, 100 percent. And um, so, yes. It is um, a double whammy, if you will. So you are being exactly. capped because you are capped because if you take one subsidy child, you have to charge that same exact rate for every single private family that you are serving. And so I that's why it's a disincentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an unintended consequence of what otherwise is a really good way for our government to help support the industry, right? It, so yes. the intention of the policy there was really good to provide and help offset the cost of high quality early education programs for our working families. But then, I mean, imagine if you compare childcare to any other business, can you think of any other industry, banking, ins insurance, construction, you know, they all have the same types of overhead and expenses and paying out wages, a livable wage to their employees, but they're not capped at how they earn that income. So in other words, they could take on as many projects as they might want to as a construction company or an insurance agent might take on as many clients as they want to. But in childcare, they say, first, you're limited by the capacity of your facility and the environment. Second, you're limited in capacity based on 
child to staff ratio. And then we're further going to wham you twice by saying you can only get paid 80% of what we deem the market rate to be. And then on top of that, you're in competition with now public education for those same childcare slots where public education is now offering um, some preschool programs. Could you, could you compare and contrast a little bit for the audience um, some of the differences that we see in maybe publicly funded programs, not to say that they're not high quality because many of them really truly are, mm-hmm. but are they the appropriate places and do we see the innovation that we see in private childcare there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, t- to your earlier point, Cindy, I would say that early childhood programs are probably the most heavily regulated industry in the entire nation um, to the point that it almost incapacitates them, um, both in terms of business model and in terms of staffing, honestly. Um, There is one other very technical piece um, that I will just mention, um, which is around certification. And there's one particular level of certification for an early childhood, um, for for working in an early childhood program. And um, you have to have your, your, credit, you have to have your hours, you have to demonstrate that you can work with children and you do your professional development hours and you have to renew as you would with any other industry, right? Nursing, banking, I mean, anything where you need to, K-12 teachers, right? You have to renew. It is the only qualification in the state that does not allow you to renew after 10 years. And um, it is it is it's a certain level in early childhood, and it's because they want you to move up the ladder, if you will. But there's some individuals that are very very happy in that level, and um, to have the state actually mandate someone not being able to stay within their own job after ten years is absolutely incredible to me. There is absolutely no other industry in the nation that absolutely mandates you out of a job um, because of a certain certification, which is absolutely crazy to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So yeah. Um, to, to your point, um, I will say there there is one. So there's two types of publicly funded programs. So um, that are that are a little bit different than the programs we've been talking about. There's one which is very, very similar to the one you're you're talking about. And it's just because, excuse me one second, I need a sip of water here. So sorry, my allergies are bothering me these days, probably like all of your listeners. Um, so yeah. there's there's one type of contract, if you will, and it is called our Title V contract. It can be held by any type of program. So it could be held by a private child care center. Um, it could be held by a for-profit center or a nonprofit center. It could be held by a local education agency. Um, and basically what that is, is a just a type of contract where the state buys the entire classroom. So it's very similar to the voucher program um, with, with, with one, a couple of differences. There are educational components that have to go. Um, there are certain child assessments that have to happen. But the variation that's a little bit different from the other scenario we were talking about is that you would have no private pay children in that particular classroom. You certainly could in other classrooms, you could have on other sites, but this would just be a situation where that entire classroom or that entire school, if you will, would be entirely funded by the state of California. There are certainly pros and cons associated with that, But those particular programs are very, very high quality. They are very much what you would find on any other high quality, 
<clears throat> excuse me, preschool program, infant toddler program, early learning and care program. They would wear, they would be where you typically would want your child to be. And they serve some of our very, very low income families. And um, those are some of our very, very best programs. The other type of program that got started in 2010, originally in California, is what we call transitional kindergarten. Many of your listeners uh, may recall that starting around 2010, 2012, there was very much a push across the nation for universal preschool. And universal preschool has very much been taken up by many, many different states in many different ways. And in California, uh, Governor Newsom, uh, when he was running uh, many, many years ago, about eight years ago now, uh, for governor of California, really ran on this universal preschool, universal care for four-year-old plan. At that time, he was not very... Um, specific about how universal care would be. But I think at that moment, we had really started learning some lessons from other states. And the lessons really were that you needed to utilize a mixed delivery system. And by mixed delivery system, we mean many different um, many different program types. So you need to use a private childcare center. You need to use family childcare homes. You need to use school-based settings because no one type of program meets all families' needs. Sometimes families need weekend hours. Sometimes they need aftercare hours. Sometimes they need before school hours. Perhaps it doesn't meet the linguistic needs or the cultural needs of the family. And so that was is what um, all of the national research was saying at that time. So then fast forward, um, what California did was completely the opposite of that. And um, California established what is called transitional kindergarten. Transitional kindergarten is loosely considered the first year of a two-year kindergarten program. And so that is for any four-year-old, um, regardless of what when they turn four in their particular year, um, they are allowed to, if they turn four between September 1st and December 1st of a particular year, they are able to enroll into transitional kindergarten. Uh, transitional kindergarten is exclusively run by school districts. So it would be on your elementary school site. It could not, it cannot be run by a preschool program. Even if your school district perhaps runs a preschool program or runs a state preschool program or runs some type of Head Start program, it cannot be run um, by that particular entity. It actually needs to be run by the elementary school division. So it would be run in partnership with the kindergarten program. And so that is the other type of new um, investment, I would say, in California. And um, to your point, Cindy, it is um, being a rocky, rocky beginning. And um, it has been a very, very big investment in California. They, um, it started in 2010, like I mentioned, it was a very subtle investment in California. Um, a number of early advocates, such as my organization, such as myself, were very, very concerned of putting our young four-year-old onto a elementary campus that does not have the same health and safety guidelines or the same adult to child supervision as our preschool programs or our early learning programs. For example, in our early learning programs, children need to be supervised all the time. There needs to be what we call constant supervision. And so it's not that an adult needs to be on that child all the time, but there needs to be someone watching them. So if there are children on the playground, um, perhaps at a sand pit, and then there are children on bicycles, there needs to be enough adults out on that outdoor area so that children 
children are being supervised in the sandpit and there are children being supervised over in that uh, in the bicycle area so that if a child is going into a dangerous area or starts doing something you know perhaps that they shouldn't do that there is an adult there to you know steer them into a different direction um that is if that does not happen in an early childhood program that is actually called lack of supervision and that is um, called a type a violation um, under community care um, community care licensing which all of our early learning programs are licensed by the community care licensing division of the department of social services type a is the worst type of violation you could have there's a b and c a is the worst and so as you can see lack of adult supervision is a really really big deal in our preschool early learning programs. Just to compare and contrast that to our transitional kindergarten environment, there is no requirement whatsoever for um, adult supervision, constant adult supervision. So that same exact age child could have on that playground perhaps no supervision for a particular moment. And there perhaps there is no requirement for the same level of adults to be out there as there would be in for that exact same age child in that early learning environment. So whereas it would be a violation, the worst type of violation in one type of program, in one type of setting for that same exact age child, we're not talking even a minute difference in age in a different program setting, so just a different environment, there would be no violation. And to me, that is very, very concerning. It equally goes, I, I mean, I could I could tell you 15 of these different examples. So I would say yeah. that there's a lot of concern on this in particular. Yeah, I, I think that and it's funny that you went right where I was hoping you would go and kind of I'm trying to understand. And, and like you said, anytime there is a change in an industry like this and policy and rulemakers and lawmakers are endeavoring to find the way forward for the best outcome. I, I have no doubt that everyone involved is trying to do the very best for our children and trying to maybe offset the lack of qualified staff to work in early care and education environments and likely um, the greater level of need in 2024 versus back in 2010. But my understanding is these public programs on public campuses, like you're talking about, where four-year-old doesn't have that consistent, active supervision by an adult, that those environments don't even have to meet the same licensing requirements or health and safety standards that these early care and education and preschool programs do. And yet I don't know that that's made completely clear for families exploring their options. It's more like this program is free and this program is going to cost you and cost you relatively close to what perhaps a college education might mm -hmm. cost. And so it's no wonder that families are, you know, when you're a young family, it doesn't matter what your income is. It seems like there's more month at the end of the month than there is paycheck. Right. A so absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm I, that is a big concern and I'm hearing it not just in California at all, but throughout the entire nation, our private preschools, our early learning and education systems are trying to compete now with public education that doesn't have to meet any of the same standards. And so it seems like a really unlevel playing field for one thing, but yes. problematic in so many ways that we don't have time to even get into today. Yes. So uh, first of all, thank you for really articulating that so very clearly that any, any lay person or parent that might be listening at least is educated now and they'll know that, you know, that old adage is true. Something given to you for free, you need to be a little bit more, um, uh, you, you need to investigate further, do your due diligence and really try to compare apples to apples, if you will. Yes. And um, I so wouldn't, yeah, I would just, just one, one quick PSA 
to all of your listeners um, if, if they find themselves in that situation. Um, if you need to go into, if, you, if you're finding yourself in that situation, because obviously school districts, they are free, you can choose which school in that school district to place your child. Ask the principal, ask the teacher, what type of early education experience do they have? how many teachers are in that classroom and try to find the individual that has the most early education experience possible so that you are at least placing your child in the best situation that you possibly can. Um, so that would be my, my uh, PSA to those individuals that find themselves out there because certainly there are some programs that are doing it a little bit better than each other, but there are, are unfortunately right now are mandates, at least in California that are coming down the pike, but they're not, they're not hitting um, anywhere quickly enough for anyone who has that aged child. Unfortunately, your, your child will be well into third or fourth grade before these mandates actually come to fruition. Well, it's good to know that people um, in California and elsewhere, policymakers, policy advocates, people who truly understand the, the um the governmental processes and how these things kind of go through our government to get approved and implemented in our states are looking closely at this. Um, what impact now? I mean, we're kind of outside the bounds of what we started mm -hmm. with here, but bring it back together for us and kind of share with us what you're seeing as the likely impact that this will have in California and other states as as early care and education and preschool and and child care uh, rates continue to rise in order to supply these high quality early learning experiences for our children and the federal government continues to unwittingly, if you will, uh, place an even higher burden and a higher standard on these business owners. What impact do you think is going to occur over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, on, on that front, I actually have some good news, surprisingly, um, which, which, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm going to, the, the federal government um, recently, recently, i.e. about two years ago, issued a change. And so that reimbursement system that I just talked about, which was that you have to do a survey for all of the child care centers, then you have to do an average per county, and then you do a percentage of it, that became optional. Prior to two years ago, that was an absolute mandate. Any state who wished to do the, um, the rate setting, if you will, in a different way was not given an option. They absolutely had to do it that way because if they were to receive any federal money, that is how that was part of them accepting and receiving that money that the rate setting had to be done that way. So two years ago, the federal government said any state who wishes to can set up an alternative methodology. That's what they're calling it. And um, so California last year, two years ago, petitioned for a waiver against that. California is the state that is serving as the guinea pig, if you will, um, for this particular process. There are some other states across the nation that has also gotten a waiver issued. I know New Mexico has also gotten issue uh, a waiver issued. Um, Oklahoma has, as well as New York, uh, but they only have the permission um, to run an alternative methodology. They haven't actually started the process. Process yet. California itself has already started the process. And so what California has started over the, the past year was that they are going to completely change the way that they do reimbursement in the state of California. And so rather than do the market survey is what they call it, right, where they where they're surveying all of the current programs to figure out how much are they charging, because we know that that's already artificially deflated. 
what they're doing is an actual cost of care survey. So they're looking at all of the different indicators. They're not necessarily surveying any program in particular, but what they are doing is they're doing baselines, baseline um, calculations. What is the cost of living and basic rent in all of these different counties, all of these different cities across the state of California? What are utility costs? What are workmen comp costs? What what is the cost of doing business with the state of California, i.e. you accept a voucher? How much time and energy does that take to process that paperwork to get that parent to sign all of that? Um, what, how much, co- you know, how much does it take to do all of your projections and all of your pieces? So what the state is doing right now is um, it's holding a series of work groups to determine what are all of those indicators. And because it's so far down the pro- so down so far down the process. What we what California is hoping to do is actually have this cost model ready by. June 30th, 2025. And so that is actually a very, very accelerated timeline. And once California has this already, I know that a number of other states are looking to see what this cost model actually looks like and what all of the indicators are going to be, which goes into this cost model. And um, they're going to likely replicate it. It is probably going to be so. So really, what they're going to look at is the the cost model again, because it's not going to be based on what what programs are charging right now. Um, means a couple of different things. It means that the state is likely going to reimburse for subsidized children, i.e., what they pay for the uh, children that they serve, is going to be a lot higher than what it is currently, because they know that. They have been underfunded, underfunding, underpaying for those children. Part of what this alternate methodology is, is that little provision that was in there, which says that any private program that accepts even one subsidy child has to charge the same is going away. So, Cindy, that little clause as of July 1, 2025 is gonna be removed. So that one barrier to entry, it is absolutely enormous and is gonna be a game changer for so many different programs. Not only is it going to help private programs to accept vouchers and to serve subsidy families because they are not going to be deflating the cost that they can charge private families. But in addition, they will actually be charged a much higher rate likely for those those families that they are um, being served for those low income subsidy families now as well. Because we do know that oftentimes lower income at risk subsidy families sometimes do have more needs than other families do. And so they will, the state will actually be paying a higher amount for it. And so the idea is that with some of these higher reimbursement rates, Perhaps there could be additional care that goes along with it, some mental health services, some additional professional development that can be given to the team. The idea is to support the whole family and the whole child. And so it's a really, really innovative model. And so uh, my organization and all of your listeners, anyone who is a child care owner out there, whether they... um, whether they're a child care owner, they're a teacher, they're involved in this space, really should really pay attention to this because it is absolutely going to be critical to have everybody's input into what these indicators are, because this is going to be the one time perhaps in the next 20 years for us to get it right. Because once we get these indicators done in terms of what are all these different factors that we need to um, calculate to make what is the cost of care? That is going to be what we are going to be living with for the next 20 years and likely what all of the other states are going to be basing their cost of care models on. So we're in really an incredibly transforma- transformational um 
time right now, which I think is going to really change not only the way California um, pays for subsidized childcare, but also the way the nation does. Yeah, and that, uh, that's that been in my experience as well, Nina. And in early care and education, um, and maybe it just harkens back to our histories, but the state of California and the state of New York tend to be the trend-setting states, and the others tend to look for their model, see kind of they stand back and wait. Let's let California and New York do it first, and then if it works out for them, we can build upon their model. So I, I have a follow-up question or two, too, actually, if, if you don't mind. Um, one is really maybe a, of a personal nature here. So it might just be Nina and Cindy, you know, kind of chatting this one out. I'm curious what you think, since we know that brain development is, is so important from zero to five, there was a study done, and I believe, I'm not going to quote this correctly probably, but back in 19, I think it was like 65, a study showed that if a child doesn't receive proper nutrition in the mm -hmm. first year of its life, he or she will never reach his or her full potential. And we've come a long way in what we understand about brain development and neuro connections that those neurosynopsis that are happening in the child's brain in, in those first couple of formative years. And when we know all of that, I, I just, maybe we could spend a minute or two lamenting mm -hmm. why as a country we invest so heavily in higher education and not that I think higher education isn't valuable, but is there any way we can do a study that shows if we invested early in zero to five, that perhaps by the time that child reaches the time for extended education, you know, they, they probably could find their own way to paying for it themselves. So it, it just kind of boggles my mind. Do you have any thoughts on that first? Yeah, I, I, absolutely, Cindy. I mean, you're you're 100 right. There are countless studies out there which just talk about brain development in young children and how crucial every single moment of a young child's life is, and all of those interactions, all of the conversations, all of those meaningful interactions, absolutely pave the way for this that child's future 100% um there was yeah. there there was actually um a, a similar survey that i was reading and it was talking about um children who were going into kindergarten and it was from a couple of years ago and it was more affluent children and their actual word count, their word knowledge had gone down for the first time in about 35 years. And the reason being was because the parent or the nanny or the caregiver was listening to earphones and was not having that interaction and that communication with a child in the stroller or the buggy or the, you know, walking along and was listening to something and not doing that verbal interaction that you normally would do as you were walking around. And so if you think about that, oh, that's not a big deal. We're just going for a run or a walk or just to the store. Actually, it is a big deal. We saw it. We saw it in terms of these children actually lost the number of words that they actually know. So, I mean, like that is just one little example, but one uh, Finland, for example, so the, the country, you know, in Scandinavia, Finland, prides so much on early development. Not only do they have incredible paid family leave, I think it's about one year off for both parents, not just one versus the other. They're allowed to take it at the same time or separate, but the amount of, um, professionalism, the amount of um, uh, the, like how much they love their early childhood teachers is on the same level of what you would consider a tenured PhD professor at Harvard. They have so much respect for their early childhood um, faculty, teachers. They pay them equally as much as they would a tenured professor, professor at an Ivy League um, university. And so in 
Finland as an example. And I think this is very much the case in Scandinavia, but I know this for a fact in Finland that, that it is considered a very, very prestigious job to work with young children because they know how those interactions pave the way for development for that child rest of their life, that they would not dream of ever putting someone who does not have the utmost quality to work with that child. And they start that child in a early learning environment very, very young. And what we think of as an academic early environment is absolutely not what they think of it. And there's a lot of outdoor play. There is a lot of individual play. There is, I mean, all of these wonderful, wonderful um, interactions that they have. And they really, truly believe that if they do not do that and set that child up, they will not have as much success later in life. And, and so they are really, you know, walking the walk of the talk that you're saying, Cindy. And so how do we get there in this country? I don't know. The United States is a very individualistic society. It will take very, very, it will take a very big cultural shift. It has always been, a, I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Why can't you do that? Um, you know, we've, we've got a wonderful school system, but it very much starts at K. And, you know, with TK, we're starting a little bit early, but I think it's going to be a very, very big shift to start thinking of those early years the same way we do our college and university years. We're still not quite there yet in this country. And it's unfortunate because I do think I, that we I think are missing you just out. Hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. I, I think you just hit the nail on the head though, Nina, when you say the United States just isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. I think that's the operative word yet, yeah. um, because what I see happening in the United States, and I've seen this now for a while, is the educators, the actual people who own these early education programs, the owners, the directors, the educators in the classroom, the family child care providers that are getting into mm -hmm. this industry are really really invested and completely passionate. Some of them are master degree teachers. Some of them yes. are PhD professors, even operating in the family childcare network in a small environment in their home because they have been through this process of realizing that you know, corporate America isn't all it's cracked up to be. People are looking for something that gives them more fulfillment, more a sense of community impact and something that lights them up on the inside of themselves. And I think we saw it through the pandemic and through COVID mm -hmm. when we established that early educators were essential workers. And I think it just takes all of us really focusing on this and stopping long enough to ask ourselves, who is more important in this world than the people who are going to be our community leaders of tomorrow? They're, they're, they're just, you know, I mean, I, I'm all for taking care of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I think we should respect our elders more than we do, but mm -hmm. I think we are making that shift slowly over time. And so we want to end on a positive note for sure. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think we're just not there yet. But Finland's a great model. Please keep sharing with us what you know about these things. I have two other questions, and I know we're going to run out of time here. One is, how can anyone, a parent that hears this podcast, a child care provider, an educator, how can we follow along with what's happening in California so that as we start to see this spread across the nation and adopt these cost of care models that we're all paying attention, that we're writing to our congressmen and our senators to make sure that we are advocating for, you know, the amount of, of uh, investment, if you will, from all sectors. I think all sectors should be involved in investing in early childcare. Um, we're seeing a lot of employer funded programs mm -hmm. popping up here and there. We're starting to see those play-based nature 
uh, model centers where kids are outdoors all day long. So I think there is a shift happening slowly in the in the subconscious mind of of Americans. And so um, let's let's keep the conversation going. But how can we stay in the know, if you will? Yes, and I absolutely agree with you. And I have I have visited some of those programs where there are PhDs running the smallest family childcare home. And you know what? Um, this this one woman I visited her home, and for babies she planted chamomile in her backyard, so when they're colicky they could lie on the chamomile. It, I was like, I need that in my backyard. Honestly, the best thing I've ever heard. Um, so absolutely, I completely agree with you. I think the trend is absolutely going that way, and I'm so pleased to hear it. Um, we're also seeing like the community school model is going that way, which I think is absolutely lovely. It's just, you know, getting the ethos of the the behemoth of the government to sort of shift that way, right? Because everything costs a little bit of money. And so to move all of that, but absolutely, I, I completely agree with you, Cindy. I think everything is moving that way. And I just love to see that um, not only individuals invested, but also families paying attention to this and, and really seeking that out. Um, so a couple of different resources, if um, parents, families, um, anyone wants to specifically in California, California, pay attention to uh, this cost of care work that is happening. If you, <clears throat> excuse me, go to um, the California Department of Social Services website, so that is www.cdss.ca.gov, and um, type in cost of care survey, you will find it right away. If not, you can use your favorite uh, search tool and put in California um, cost of care survey, you will be able to find that um, as well. My organization, Every Child California, we have a free list serve, um, which once a week will will send out a legislative briefing. It's completely complimentary. If individuals would like to sign up for that, they are more than welcome to as well. Um, if, they if they go to my organization's website, which is everychildca.org, um, we send out information, again, about what's happening in California specifically, but we do send out some national things as well, which includes certainly the cost of care survey, what's happening in California, um, and some of those national pieces as well. Um, those would be the two places I would say in, in particular, if any of your listeners are looking more on a national level, I would say the National Women's Law Center has a legislative listserv where they send things out about once a week. And they do a roundup, if you will, on what is happening in child care, just generally speaking, um, on once a week on a national level. And that would be a very good listserv, I would say, for some of your listeners who would like more of that broad nationwide perspective. I love it. That is so helpful. So helpful. So as we wind up, I, I, I we always ask our guests to share with us a, a personal motto, a motivational <laughs> quote, something that inspires you every day as you get up and do this important work. You know, it's... Um, there, there's so many of them that I was actually thinking, um, but there's there's one that I I really just do harbor and take take to heart, and it is that all of this is bigger than just one of us, but one of us can make that difference, and that's so true because each one of us is that little spark that with all of that, those little sparks together just makes such a huge difference. And I have seen that. And um, no one little action is small. All of those little actions together are humongous. So I would, to me, I always say, 
you know, to my members, to anyone who's listening, even if you think filling in that one letter, clicking that one button, if you think maybe it's just silly, it's never going to make a difference, please know it does make a difference because it adds into everything else. And all of us combined really do make a difference into this wonderful direction that we're going. So, um, so thank you, Cindy, for having me on today. This has been just such an incredible pleasure just to talk to you and just talk to everybody today. Well, it's such an important topic. And, and I know everyone that listens to our podcast agrees that this just is such an essential industry. And we, we really value our early education providers. So thank you, Nina, for joining us. We look forward to working together with you and, and hearing more from you because you really just have a wealth of knowledge to share. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure.